Good morning or good afternoon, and welcome to this uh, Easy Power webinar. Um, today's topic will be NFPA 70, um, CSA Z462, a field implementation of uh, the risk assessment procedure. Uh, my name is Terry Becker. Uh, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm the senior vice president at Danatech Educational Services. I'm a certified electrical safety compliance professional and an IEEE senior member. I am the first past vice chair of the CSA Z462 Workplace Electrical Safety Standard. I'm currently the working group leader for the annexes, uh, also a voting member on the CSA Z462 Tech Committee. I do attend and participate, the NF participate in the NFPA 70E uh, Tech Committee meetings and specifically do uh, support the annexes working group. I'm a voting member on the IEEE 1584 uh, Tech Committee. Uh, in Canada, I'm also an associate member on the CSA Z463 guideline for maintenance of electrical systems. Um, my work involves completing electrical safety audits, I'm developing and implementing electrical safety programs, um, providing uh, low and high voltage uh, training solutions industry, as well as blended training, uh, which uses e-learning and instructor-led training, and I am the subject matter expert and visionary of the electrical safety training system electrical worker e-learning course. You may have known uh, of me through ESPS, Electrical Safety Program Solutions, Inc. Uh, I sold my company, ESPS, to Danatech Educational Services effective August 1st, and I continue to offer uh, all of the electrical safety consulting products and training solutions that uh, ESPS had offered. So there's a bit of a disclaimer uh, that I always offer when I do uh, public presentations. Because I am a voting member of the CSA Z462 Tech Mini, um, basically today uh, I am here presenting uh, on my own personal technical opinions and interpretations of both the NFPA 70E, Standard for Electrical Safety in the Workplace, and the CSA Z462 standard, and uh, any official um, interpretation that you may require, uh, you are encouraged to consult the published editions of NFPA 70E, the 2018 edition, and in January, the published uh, edition of CSA Z462 2018, and you can also consult with NFPA or CSA for a specific uh, technical interpretation from those organizations. So our agenda for today is I wanted to spend some time discussing the risk assessment procedure requirement of NFPA 70E and Z462. And as a word of note, the do those documents are technically harmonized. So when I do present this information, I will be using content from NFPA 70, the 2018 edition, which published here in the last couple of weeks. Um, but when I make technical comments, it does apply uh, equally to the CSA Z462 standard, the 2018 edition that we'll publish in January. So basically, I will just provide some comments um, on the standards um, and, the, and, and briefly the differences that we will be seeing in the 2018 editions, specifically related to the risk assessment procedure. I will put this under the context of an electrical safety program requirement, which is a mandatory requirement of both NFPA 70E and CSA Z462. Just some brief definitions of what is risk and risk assessment. Um, what I found in working with industry is that there's a misunderstanding of the risk assessment procedure. And so we just got to pull back from that. Then we got to look at, you know, what is risk and what's risk assessment. And then within the context of NFPA 70E and Z462, and what I've listed next on the agenda is Article 110.1G, the risk assessment procedure in NFPA 70, the 2015 edition. And then it has now changed. It has moved to 110.1H um, risk assessment procedure in the NFPA 70 2018 edition. So we're going to specifically focus in on that article um, or the equivalent clause in CSA Z462 today. Uh, I'm going to discuss those articles or clauses. And then I'm going to put my sort of uh, interpretation on, you know, what is this risk assessment procedure and specifically how can you implement uh, a, a, pro a process to actually um, document your risk assessments for discrete energized electrical work tasks. Again, I will emphasize that I believe this is misunderstood um, in industry. And then basically the, the next bullet says, what is the role of the arc flash risk assessment and the shock risk assessment that are also a mandatory requirement to be completed uh, within your company's electrical safety program and by the qualified person or what I call the qualified electrical worker. So that the context of, of those risk assessments, uh, I'll comment on them. And there has been some updates uh, to those uh, risk assessment articles or clauses, specifically some significant changes to the arc flash risk assessment clause. Um, quite a material change to it, actually, um, and a material change to the related 
uh, arc flash PP category tables, which in previous editions of 70 and Z462 was the hazardous category table method. Um, and then field implementation of a risk assessment procedure will be a specific example um, of a, a tailored uh, customized risk assessment procedure um, that includes a risk register table and an electrical hazard risk assessment matrix. So again, I've got a limited amount of time and we'll dive right into this. So we, we continue to see evolution and change uh, in NFPA 70E. Uh, and again, Z462, that's technically harmonized. Um, the standards continue to become more focused on occupational health and safety management systems and the requirements under um, that context. And this does relate specifically to the risk assessment content uh, of the document. And so in the O18 editions, um, there's been further clarity um, in different articles and clauses to clean up any miscommunication that we're strictly looking at hazards. Um, we are not. Uh, identifying hazards is only one component of the overall risk assessment procedure. So I encourage you to get more information um, on the 2018 edition. Um, and if your company is, is, has not even moved to implementing practices or updating your electrical safety program to the 2015 edition, I really do encourage you to catch up quickly. Um, again, the 015 editions did change significantly. That's where where we saw the focus change from hazard to risk. And as I said, in the OET editions, the, the language and the articles and clauses further cleans up, um, making sure that the, the language and the, the processes um, are risk assessment based. So uh, the, the context of electrical safety program, and again, in my travels in industry um, and doing consulting and work and attending conferences, um, specifically at AAA Electrical Safety Workshop, I think there is still a misunderstanding of what an electrical safety program is. In NFPA 70 2018, it's still Article 110.1 with a series of, of, of sub-article requirements, including the risk assessment procedure. You'll notice back here that that was uh, Article 110 under electrical safety program. Um, currently now in the 18 edition, it's, it's uh, sub-article uh, H. So your company needs to have a document electrical safety program. And it is prescriptive language in, in the standards, so it shall be documented and implemented as a component of your overall occupational health and safety management system. So I believe companies really have not spent enough time to dig into that, to really make the electrical safety program their core focus. And within the electrical safety program, the risk assessment procedure needs to be included. Um, so your electrical safety program should identify the risk assessment procedure requirement it should provide a process for your company to document um, a discrete energized electrical work tasks uh, risk assessment procedure. And we will again today go through a specific example. Um, there are many ways to implement uh, risk assessments. And uh, the one that I use is actually from the 2015 edition of NFPA 70E. So what is risk and risk assessment? So ANSI Z10 is the Occupational Health and Safety management system standard for the United States. In Canada, we have CSA Z1000. Um, Z10 has these definitions of risk assessment where you'll find CSA Z1000 does not. Um, so risk, and this is important, is, a, is an estimate of the combination of likelihood of occurrence of a hazard event or exposures and the severity of injury or illness that may be caused by the event or exposure. And it's pointing to Appendix F in ANSI Z10. The risk assessment, and it says it right there is a process or processes used to evaluate the level of risk associated with the identified hazards and system issues. Now within NFPA 70 and Z462, we have some definitions for risk and risk assessment that are slightly different. And then they're more aligned with the risk assessment procedure that's identified in NFPA 70 E and Z462. So I'll read those out. It says risk, a combination of the likely occurrence of injury or damage to health and the severity of injury or damage to health that results from a hazard. So you can see that between ANSI Z10 and 70 and Z462, it's similar. And now the risk assessment is, is slightly different. And it says an overall process that identifies hazards, estimates the likelihood of occurrence of injury or damage to health, estimates the potential severity of injury or damage to health, and determines if protective measures are required. All right, so uh, the other thing and why I did have it on the screen is the informational note is important. As used in this standard, 
arc flash risk assessment and shock risk assessment are types of risk assessments. So that's important to note. The overall risk assessment procedure is a separate process from an arc flash risk assessment and a shock risk assessment. The arc flash and shock risk assessments feed in um, additional protective measures into the overall risk assessment procedure to reduce the inherent or initial risk level to a residual risk level that will be as low as reasonably practicable, but only um, from the perspective of potential of injury or damage to health. The arc flash and shock risk assessments only provide additional protective measures to hopefully drive down or mitigate the harm or drive it down. For instance, arc flash PPE drives down the inherent um, potential injury or damage to health from third degree burn or worse to the 50% probability of the onset of a second degree burn. So when you do your risk assessments, you're going to look at, again, severity of injury or damage to health, and you're going to compare it to likelihood of occurrence. And we'll have some more information coming on likelihood of occurrence. Now, what we have on the screen now is the, the NFPA 70E uh, or CSA Z462 2015 risk assessment procedure article. In this case, it's the 70E article. So basically what you see on the screen is there's three steps which were identified in the definition. So previously, uh, NFPA 70 required you to do an electrical hazard analysis. It was strictly focused on the hazards and get PP on a worker, a qualified person, and establish boundaries. Now that context changed in the 015 edition, and you're going to see that the risk assessment procedure has a substantial change to it in the 2018 edition. So I wanted to start here saying this is what um, 70 mandates as the risk assessment procedure. It says your electrical safety program shall include a risk assessment procedure that addresses employee exposure to electrical hazards. The procedure shall identify the process to be used by the employee before work is started to carry out the following. Identify if they're exposed to arc flash and shock hazards. Assess risks related to the work task assigned to them. And then implement risk control according to the hierarchy of methods. Now the hierarchy of methods, as you can see, was an informational note in the 2015 edition and it does quote ANSI Z10. And now that will be a significant change in the 018 as that informational note now moves uh, into a, a sub-article. And therefore it's mandatory that you should consider all of the hierarchy of controls and you should be looking at them from top down, not bottom up. The mistake that's happened in industry is a bottom up approach was taken to the application of these control methods because the focus was on hazard and PPE, which you can see is at the bottom. When in reality, 70E and Z462 basically say we need to de-energize first as a priority, then justify energized electrical work, and then proceed with that work. And then with this risk assessment procedure, we should really be looking at you know, the remaining controls to reduce the inherent or initial risk level to a residual risk level that is as low as reasonably practical. So what we're gonna see is, is the change. This is the change. This is the 2018 um, risk assessment procedure that will be both in 70E and Z462 now, you can still see that the front end is the same. There is, you know, the first element of this, uh, or first sub-article of this item H, is to identify hazards, assess risks, implement risk control. So that was similar. But you'll notice um, that there's been a little bit of clarification, and now human error has been added. Human error was not noted at all. And as well, there is a brand new uh, informative annex Q, which is human performance and electrical safety. So it puts focus on human error now in the risk assessment procedure and that you shall consider human error when you do your likelihood of occurrence evaluation or the, that component of the risk assessment procedure. And now you shall use this hierarchy of risk controls. So if on the left-hand side, you'll notice that there's three, then the other three on the right-hand side, and then there's been some additional information notes added. The important one is information, well, they're all important, but information note one says elimination, substitution, engineering controls are the most effective methods to reduce risk as they usually are applied to the source of possible injury or damage to health, and they're less likely to be affected by human error. Awareness, administrative controls, and PPE are the least effective methods to reduce risk as they're not applied at the source and they're not more, they are more, likely to be affected by human error. So again, this whole concept of human error is now embedded, and if you weren't considering human error in your risk assessment procedure, 
you definitely need to. But if you had um, effectively interpreted the risk assessment procedure, you most likely were uh, considering human error. Again, so I'm setting sort of the, the tone here for this example, this field uh, implementation of risk assessment procedure that I'm going to cover. So some general comments about a risk assessment procedure. It is an analytical process. Um, and again, you, you can use different methods to you know, put some values against harm and like of occurrence, and you'll see an example of that. And it's important that, that the risk assessment procedure puts weight on both consequence, which is severity of injury or damage to health in this case from arc flash, arc blast, because arc blast has had a profile in industry, but we need to downplay the arc blast uh, issue, uh, and we will, and I'll make some comments on that, and then shock. And then in the context of the risk assessment procedure, we have an energized electrical work task discreetly identified as voltage measurement as an example, and then we will have voltage measurement with what's called a work task hazard pair. Voltage measurement on some electrical equipment at some maximum nominal voltage. Based on the maximum nominal voltage, then we would determine if an arcing fault and arc flash can occur and result in the potential for injury or damage to health related to a burn injury. All right, and then basically separately, you would consider blast as a secondary effect, and then separately, you know, for a voltage measurement, you know, is the voltage, the nominal voltage high enough, AC or DC, that there's a shock risk. And again, this is a, the qualified person or qualified electrical worker getting the voltage measurement work task, identifying it as on some electrical equipment, and then getting the maximum nominal voltage in the box, and then saying they are exposed. So that's the first step of the risk assessment procedure. And again, we're now moving into what the second and third step are as, as I get closer to you know, giving you some, some information here on how you can use a risk register table and an electrical hazard risk assessment matrix to actually then implement um, the actual risk assessment procedure. So it's a subjective process. You have to be very careful um, that you're not too conservative, that you are very practical in your assessment, um, specifically of likelihood of occurrence parameters uh, related to probability of the arcing fault and arc flash and probability of the shock exposure. And again, you shall apply the arc of control methods to reduce the risk level. This statement, there is no zero risk level. There's always going to be some residual risk, right? And it's the risk that's left over and it's this concept of risk. So the risk could be that there is still some potential harm, right? Or there's still a like of occurrence that's residual after applying the arc of controls, but that that residual risk level, lower medium is how I would discuss it, is acceptable and, and we proceed, but then we have to make sure we document all of the control methods that are applied basically in our risk assessment procedure to achieve the residual risk level. I know this is a, a mouthful and it's, it's, it's a bit to take in, but it is not that complicated. I've heard statements that, oh, an electrician can't be trained to do this, we don't know how to do this. Well, no, you have to spend some time and you have to put some information in your electrical safety program and find a method that will work for your company. Your company might have an existing risk assessment procedure and a matrix for large industrials, specifically petrochemical, very common, but you have to be careful when you have that overall risk assessment process and matrix because that matrix um, would be maybe somewhat complicated for uh, an employee to apply because it typically considers stock price and impact on environment, safety, um, so there's other elements or other consequences that those uh, risk assessments consider and we don't want uh, the qualified person, uh, qualified electrical worker to get bogged down on that, they will, they will reject that. But if you use the risk assessment procedure that was provided in NFPA 70Z462 2015 in Annex F, um, you can come up with a process that I think is, is simple. There's some flow charts, you can simplify the flow charts, you can create a risk register table. You can go through the process uh, with your electrical safety steering committee. Just don't don't be too conservative, but obviously then don't be too uh, as well on the risk side. Be practical in your assessment of arcing fault probability uh, and the impact of blast pressure. For blast pressure, I call it the 40 cal myth. Uh, industry has unfortunately established that 40 calories per centimeter squared is a dangerous sense energy level, and that's not true. Um, and again, the two notes actually um, that mentioned. Um, increased emphasis on 40, if it's above 40 calories, will be deleted uh, finally from the standards. So moving back to the risk assessment procedure, once uh, you get into this process, um, you have to apply the hierarchy of control methods, which show up in ANSI Z10, CSA Z1000, 
and now are part of the, the main requirements of Z462 and 70E in um, the risk assessment procedure article or clause. And so here they are again, uh, elimination, and there has been um, some additional changes in the 2018 edition related to elimination. The uh, lockout tagout content has been uh, rejigged, improved upon. Um, the training requirements for lockout tagout are now embedded uh, in Article uh, or Article 110 uh, after .110.1, uh, where lockout tagout training is now identified in the training section. Um, so if you don't have formal lockout tagout training, it's now been highlighted that you need to. Uh, and again, some rework of the lockout tagout uh, requirements. So just be cognizant of that as you review the differences um, between the 015 and 018 that the, uh, the, the Laco Tago section has been updated and, and some content shifted around related training. So elimination is establishing a likely safe work condition. And that process, by the way, has also changed in the 2018 edition uh, of Z462 and 70. So make sure you do look at um, the changes to establishing a likely safe work condition. Now there are eight steps instead of six possible steps to uh, implementing that, uh, that process. So substitution with other materials, systems, or processes, engineering controls. So an engineering control would be we do an arc flash incident energy analysis study, and we install some mitigation to reduce the incident energy. Arc flash relays, maintenance mode switches, um, just changing protective device settings. So that's engineering controls as an example. Awareness is warning signs and barricading, um, using equipment labels for arc flash and shock. Um, but I put more attention on signage and um, establishing an electrical work zone uh, with the boundary information that comes from the arc flash and shock risk assessment. Administrative controls are training and procedures. Uh, a lot of training is happening, but I do find gaps with procedures being written uh, in the workplace. All right, so again, that, that's a little more information on hierarchy of controls. As I said earlier, the role of the arc flash risk assessment and the shock risk assessment is independent of the risk assessment procedure. They feed additional protective measures into the risk assessment procedure to drive down the potential of injury or damage to health. These two assessments are not the risk assessment procedure. What I've come across in industry um, is that there has maybe been training or an assessment that the risk assessment procedure is just completing the air flash risk assessment and the shock risk assessment, which is not true. Those are two separate risk assessments, which I said earlier, there's a bit of a note that has clarified that. Um, so both these articles have had some minor updates in the 2018 edition of the standards, and specifically the arc flash risk assessment has changed substantially. So again, be aware of that, uh, and make sure you do put some focus on reviewing the arc flash risk assessment, um, as it is, it is improved, in my opinion. It is, again, further aligned with risk assessment standards, uh, and the existing table uh, 130.7C15AA, which is table 4A and Z462 has now been completely removed from the arc flash PIP category table method. So we basically have the shock risk assessment and really the, the, the big change in the shock risk assessment and the arc flash risk assessment right at the front is they now include sort of the three steps again of the overall risk assessment procedure, but specific to the shock hazard and the arc flash hazard. Identify if you're exposed to the shock hazard, Make sure you do an estimate of the likelihood of occurrence of injury and you know, sorry, of injury or damage to health and the potential severity of injury or damage to health. And then the third step is determine if additional protective measures, that's sort of a new term now, uh, determine if additional protective measures are required, including the use of PPE. So these additional protective measures for the shock risk assessment and the arc flash risk assessment would be the boundaries. There's one arc flash boundary and two shock, pro shock approach boundaries, limited and restricted. And those boundaries then provide guidance on what worker can encroach on them and when you need PP, for instance, inside restricted, you have to be, you know, have shock related PP tools and equipment used. If you're inside the arc flash boundary and you create an arcing fault potential, um, do your work task, um, then the arc flash boundary is real and the arc flash boundary is really to keep unqualified, unprotected people out because you will have the PP on as you identify in your arc flash risk assessment for uh, the related arc flash hazard. So again, remember, these are independent of the risk assessment procedure, but they feed into the risk assessment procedure, specifically again, to affecting in a positive manner, the potential injury or damage to health. So field implementation of the risk assessment procedure, it really needs to include a documented electrical safety program. 
Your company has to have one developed and implemented. And within the electrical safety program, you embed the risk assessment procedure as basically a discussion of how you expect it to be completed. Um, then if you, again, develop a specific risk register table and a specific electrical hazard risk assessment matrix, you would further explain how those tools are used to complete uh, a discrete uh, energized electrical work test risk assessment procedure. Um, and again, documenting that in this case, the process I'm gonna show you, that you've taken the inherent or initial risk level and you've reduced it such that the residual risk level is again, as low as reasonably practical. So what I do is I recommend companies get the program and then they have an electrical safety steering committee uh, that's responsible for uh, the, the, the ongoing management of that program. After it's developed, the electrical safety steering committee has responsibility for maintenance and updating the program. The electrical safety steering committee could do a committee-based risk assessment uh, procedure for a uh, typical inventory of energized electrical work tasks. The beauty of 70 and Z462 is with the changes in the OE10 edition, they've made it, this table independent for arc flash specifically, uh, which used to be then in the previous uh, tables I mentioned earlier. So the new table uh, for 70 is table 130.7C, and the new table for CSA Z462 is table two. Those are work task tables, um, and then they talk about condition of maintenance, and now they change the context to likelihood of occurrence of an arcing fault in an arc flash. And these two tables are now used independently, right, of the actual incident energy analysis or the arc flash PP category table method as the starting point of your arc flash risk assessment. Work task, condition of equipment, like of occurrence, yes or no. And if it's yes, then you would proceed to then identify additional protective measures, PP and the arc flash boundary, and again, the working distance um, for the, the, the qualified person to execute the work task with. So again, your committee would, would, would also hopefully take some ownership to uh, get the air flash risk assessment data, either in synergy analysis or the confirmation of the parameters of the arc flash category table sorted out for your workers. So you do committee-based risk assessments, which is what I recommend, and you'll have maybe management sponsor, you'll have an um, electrical engineer if you have one on staff, most companies don't, but you'll have your electrical maintenance supervisor and representatives of the electrical workers. Uh, and then you'll basically, as a committee, um, do these uh, risk assessments for typical work tasks and you can deliver those to the, the working community. Um, and then the, the key is, is the workers that receive these risk levels for, for instance, a voltage measurement, maybe it's a medium risk. Um, the workers have to then confirm the application and, and document their application of the hierarchy of the control methods that were assumed um, by the, uh, the community-based risk assessment to be applied. So again, the process that I'm outlining, it starts with uh, an inherent or initial risk level being determined and then in this case, you'll if you do uh, and have referred to Annex F and 70, it, it has a, a flowchart that talks about an iterative process of the application of the control methods. I basically say, hey, let's apply them all at the same time. Let's apply every one of those hierarchy of controls from inherent um, to initial risk level to the residual risk level. We do one iteration. All right. And then, then you achieve this residual risk level. The key is, repeating myself, the qualified electrical worker, the qualified person, shall document their application of the assumed control methods that delivered an acceptable residual risk level, lower medium risk level in the process that I'm going to show you here shortly. So here's a simple flowchart um, that, that you've probably seen um, possibly before, but it's, it's a high level flowchart for risk assessment. You establish the context of the risk assessment. Again, you identify the hazards, you do risk analysis, risk evaluation, you apply risk controls, and then you need to monitor and review those controls right, which is again, this field documentation component that I talk about, and then there's communication and consultation. So you do need to work with the workers um, that are going to be exposed um, using, well, if, if it's just the supervisor that's doing the risk assessment with the employee, yes, then you have to completely consult and communicate with them. But if you do this by committee, um, there definitely has to be some communication uh, and um, interaction and collaboration with the, with, the, with the greater community of electrical workers uh, within your company or if you use contractors and that's a whole other discussion if you have only contractors working for you and you're the owner of the facility then you'd have to work with your electrical contractor and communicate um, again that there's hazards are flash and shock and we've assessed the risks and here's what we believe the residual risk level is um, if uh, the hierarchy of controls are applied 
So when you go on the internet and you just search risk assessment, this is what you'll probably see. These are uh, matrices, of course, and you can see oh, how many are on there. Oh, looks like uh, oh, 9, 10, 13 or so. So these are all applicable to whoever developed them and how they're being used. I'm going to show you one that uh, will look very similar to these. Um, and, and usually, again, you've got severity um, on the one side and likely occurrence um, on the other side, so X and, and uh, Y axes. And again, you've got to be careful how these <laughs> are configured differently um, when you do look at them and, and try to understand the context of the matrix and how it's applied in, in the risk assessment procedure that you perform. Now, here's the one. Here's the one that I, I use and I recommend. It's very simple. So there's an electrical hazardous matrix over here on the left you'll see, which looks similar to, uh, to some of these, right? Uh, and then we have this risk register table, which is just a simple table. Over here on the right-hand side, you'll see a sort of a spreadsheet version. And then there's three work task hazard pairs. So you would enter a voltage measurement up here um, and then identify the maximum nominal voltage of the voltage measurement. You would identify the equipment that the, that the voltage measurement is going to be performed on. And then you would do your inherent and residual risk assessment. Um, but I broke out the three work task hazard pairs. So over here on the left, um, arc flash is, is a burn injury problem. Blast is a physical trauma problem. And shock is a unique electrical phenomenon of current flow through the human body with, uh, with, an, with an effect based on how much current uh, flows through the body, the, the flow uh, direction through the body and the duration of exposure. So, and then there's consequence uh, or severity values that are equated against um, the different uh, levels of harm. And again, over here on the left, it's just I've lumped them all uh, over on the left and basically you'd have to know what the different severities are, which is, is broken out in this example over on, on the right-hand side here. Then the like of occurrence parameters, and these are derived from, uh, again, Annex F of the uh, 2015 edition of 70 and Z462. There's three sub-parameters of like of occurrence to consider, uh, frequency of exposure, the probability, and avoidance. And, and really the frequency in this context is how often is the worker um, exposed to arc flash and shock or how often do they do voltage measurements at your facility. And then you would select hourly, daily, weekly, and you would enter that value in your risk register table. And then probability is really where the, the, the highest impact is. And the way that I frame probability is do you have qualified and competent workers? Do you manage their human performance behavior? And do you manage the condition of maintenance of your electrical equipment? And the condition of maintenance has been propped up in several articles and clauses in 70 and Z462 um, that it is a key requirement uh, related to probability of an arc fault, uh, specifically an arc flash, and could be a, a, you know, another factor related to shock uh, with degradation of insulation in electrical equipment. Avoidance. And the context of avoidance, the way that I explain it is, is I sort of focus on two items, is, is by the design of the equipment, can we avoid exposure to arc flash and shock? And if, if a worker does detect some abnormal condition in real time, a change maybe from normal to abnormal while they're working on the electrical equipment, um, can they egress? Can they identify an egress? Uh, and again, likely possible or impossible, sort of blending those two requirements under avoidance. So sort of what I'm framing for you is you have this matrix. Um, the context of the matrix is, again, severity uh, or injury or damage to health on the, on the left-hand side of the example I'm providing you and the like of occurrence on the right-hand side, but you need to do this evaluation. So you have to do an evaluation now using, using this information uh, in the matrix, which occurs um, in, in the uh, risk register table. So now here's an example where the risk register table has been filled out. Um, we have some new acronyms and, and the risk assessment procedure comes with a new language. So we have to learn some new terms and phrases, um, some new acronyms, and depending on your company sets it up, it could be, uh, I, I use a process of multiplication or summation. I've just used a simple summation process, I'm blending severity and like recurrence to come up with a risk class um, for the work task hazard pair. Uh, and again, you would apply this to voltage measurement, to current measurement, racking an auto power circuit breaker, installing temporary protective grounds, um, any, any discrete work task in which we have a, a list uh, in 70 and Z462. So you inherently do a baseline uh, risk level or inherent risk level. In this case, I, I said, let's start with no electrical specific PP tools and equipment. And that was the past. And it really does frame it for you that without PP um, using a risk assessment procedure, we had high risk work for arc flash and we had high risk work for shock. The way that I frame blast is uh, blast is a secondary effect of arc flash. 
and there's no documented fatalities related to blast pressure. So I put the severity down to uh, basically repairable uh, physical trauma inherently. And then residually for blast, I said there's no PP, so the residual harm would still be the same, which would be repairable uh, physical trauma. But inherently, we know that arc flash can ignite non-arc-rated clothing, causing a, a third-degree burn injury, which accelerates and the, and the worker doesn't survive. And then for inherent risk for shock, basically I said, you know, if you're not wearing rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors and using other insulating and insulating hand tools, um, you can get electrocuted. So this is the context that I'm explaining to you in this example. And, and so inherently, uh, we take the highest risk level of the three work task hazard pairs, and that's the overall uh, inherent risk level of the work task, in this case, voltage measurement, as our example. So that's not acceptable. So then we apply arc flash and shock risk assessments. We look at the hierarchy of control methods, um, procedures, uh, more training. Um, and can we do anything to, to lower the arc flash? Uh, again, the other, the other control methods. And when we, when we apply the arc flash and shock risk assessments, you can see that arc flash gets driven down from a severity of eight to a severity of three. So arc flash, uh, we know the PP only limits the burn injury uh, to the 50% probability of the onset of secondary burn. Blast, I said there's no PP. Uh, and again, I wanna make a comment here that, that electricians have called arc flash suits bomb suits. And they're not bomb suits. Uh, I'd encourage you to watch the movie The Hurt Locker uh, with Jeremy Reamer, and it's a really good movie by the way, but he is a uh, bomb squad technician in the US Army. And um, the movie, I think, based in Afghanistan. And it's a really good example of, of, of the bomb suit, but also the limitations of any PP. Uh, the bomb suit he wears protects his core body um, from the pressure wave, or at least from the explosion if it occurs. But his limbs um, would be potentially uh, damaged um, or potentially blown off. And his hands, well, he doesn't have anything on his fingers because he needs to, you know, diffuse uh, bombs with, uh, with uh, wire gauges that are significantly small. Um, so uh, small wire size. So again, there's an example where blast pressure, we don't want to call our flash suits, bomb suits, they're not. They don't provide any blast protection. Um, they predominantly, again, uh, provide burn injury reduction uh, for workers. So when you apply the, 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 the PPE and, and uh, the, the control methods of boundaries and make decisions and have training and, and uh, procedures and, and warning signs and barricading and, and other engineering safety by design and uh, substitution controls, um, you evaluate uh, the impact uh, potential on frequency of exposure, uh, probability, and avoidance. So you can see that I used a four, uh, which was that uh, we are weekly doing voltage checks at, at our facility. And then for probability, um, for my assessment and my assumptions, I assumed we had qualified and competent workers. I assumed that we had human performance behavior managed. And I assumed that we do maintenance. So basically, I put the probability of an arc default and an arc flash and a shock risk exposure at negligible. And then avoidance, initially, um, you know, maybe we had some older equipment um, amongst some new equipment and, and we couldn't, you know, have uh, in, uh, trust in, in avoidance uh, of the older equipment. So initially we, we had that, but we replaced that equipment. So then residually, um, the avoidance went from possible to likely. And what you'll see is the risk class numbers changed um, to quite a significant lower number based on the reduction of injury or damage to health and the impact of avoidance also being reduced in this case. Each one of these would be a potential sensitivity analysis, uh, and you can then adjust um, the numbers based on, on you know, changing the context. What if we didn't have a qualified and competent worker? What would happen, right? Would the risk level go up? Well, it should. So again, you start with your baseline and, your, and then your baseline residual, and then you can run sensitivity analysis using this tool. So ultimately, this is a documented risk assessment procedure. Um, using again Annex F, which I created a risk register table and a, and a matrix and a process, and this works. This this does work to uh, document uh, and energize electrical work tasks uh, risk assessment procedure. Now this is a an example of taking it to the next level. So um, you take the whole list of energized electrical work tasks from 70 and Z462, put in a spreadsheet, and then you layer in some additional information. Do we need an energized electrical work permit? How are we documenting the actual information in the field? Do we have a document to do that? We also put in the context of you know, other workers and, and impact, qualified operations workers in large industrial facilities. They operate energized electrical equipment, turn it on and off, they do isolation. So you can expand the context uh, above and beyond a qualified person or a qualified electrical worker. And you'll notice that I put in the spreadsheet an inherent risk level uh, columns 
and the residual risk level columns. So again, you can move from a simple uh, Excel spreadsheet risk register table to a more complicated, not complicated, more detailed uh, and complete Excel spreadsheet as a uh, risk register. Again, documenting the risk assessment procedure for your company, for your uh, electrical systems and, and your staff or consult, sorry, your staff or contractors. So again, I had a limited amount of time today. Um, so I've gone through this fairly quickly and, and I, I hope that you will have um, received some additional insight um, into what you may be doing and going, yeah, we're doing something like that. This looks good. Or, wow, um, you're right. We did not and have not been doing a risk assessment procedure. We have only been doing arc flash risk assessment and shock risk assessment. So again, I encourage you to, uh, and if you are listening, you're, 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 you want to get additional information that you do, uh, you know, when this is emailed out to you, take a second or third listen to this webinar. Um, and again, just closing remarks, you've got to have a document electrical safety program that is compliant. So there's another word I didn't mention earlier, a compliant electrical safety program. If you don't know what that means, find out. And um, I do know what that means. So your, your electrical safety program can't be one page, can't be 10. It needs to be a few more pages than that. But it's really not the pages. It's the framework. It's the framework of the table of contents. Is it complete? And can you audit it against occupational health and safety management systems for completeness? The risk assessment procedure shall be documented. And your electrical safety program has to basically outline the specific risk assessment procedure that you'll be implementing with what tools you're going to use to document it. And again, the qualified person, or qualified electrical worker, as I call it, they need to be integral to that discussion, either because they're part of a committee and doing typical risk assessments and making assumptions, and or they are the individual uh, actual worker that receives a work order, planned or reactive, and then has to go, you know, what am I doing? What are the discrete energized electrical work tasks related to the work order? Am I exposed to arc flash and shock? And then they understand the context of risk. What does it mean to them now as far as their personal risk? Because that, that's, that's the goal here is we do not want the worker to be exposed at, at all, but we will always need energized electrical work. We'll always need diagnostics and troubleshooting and isolation related work tasks. The only way we can establish an electrically safe work condition is by turning the power off and then isolating, you know, the power um, following the steps of establishing an electrically safe work condition, which involves um, potential exposure, arc flash and shock, and then testing for zero volts is energized electrical work. So again, we'll, we'll have to apply the risk assessment procedure to just isolation activities because there is arc flash and shock risk exposure to a qualified person slash qualified electrical worker just to even do isolation. So we need diagnostic and troubleshooting and we need isolation to continue. And again, you need to, you need to, you, you, you need to properly interpret what 70 and Z462 are communicating to us and, and properly implement its requirements under a compliant electrical safety program. Remember, the arc flash risk assessment and the shock risk assessment, they are not the risk assessment procedure. Those are separate risk assessments that are important to the overall risk assessment procedure. Field implementation requires that your risk assessment procedure be documented and should include documenting the hierarchy of control methods applied to achieve the residual risk level. This is critical. OSHA in the US and OHS regulations in Canada. There's three words I tell people, document, document, document. So again, I do talk to a lot of people in industry. I work with a lot of people. And I, I tell them that you, you just can't take 70 and Z462 and train a worker on it and buy them PPE. It's weak due diligence. And if you do have an incident, you will still potentially be, you know, fined or worse. So you've got to make sure that you pay attention to where you are in this process, in the, in the timeline of implementing 70 or Z462's requirements. And you need to get an electrical safety program and drive everything through the electrical safety program. It all goes back to the electrical safety program. Everything you do, why you do it, the benefit, right, the justification for doing it, it's all driven through the electrical safety program and it's all driven through risk reduction and the worker. So at the end of the, at the end, the quote here at the end, safety is not easy. 
it needs to be managed. So you can't just say, well, we trained the workers five years ago, we bought them PP, and you know, I think they're doing this, right? It's an ongoing endeavor. It is a continuous improvement model, a plan, do, check, act model, right? You cannot stop. Once you start, you're in it. And every three years, 70 and Z462 change, and you must understand those changes, and you must implement and update your practices through your program. And in turn, yes, train your workers on the new requirements. And this risk assessment procedure and the concept of risk is here to stay. And it is not complicated. It is not difficult. It isn't necessarily easy, but easy is you know, a relative term. The risk assessment procedure I just showed you, it's easy, but you have to implement some documentation, understand the documentation, and make sure your workers understand it, your supervisors understand it, management sponsors it, and, and, and that you do the risk assessments and back to what I said, implement those controls. You must have documentation that, that you've implemented the control methods to achieve the residual risk level related to a discrete energized electrical work task. So remember, under a work order or a job, there may be one or multiple discrete energized electrical work tasks to achieve fulfilling that work order, solving the problem. So be careful too because the work tasks have to be risked independently. All right, details required, documentation shall be created and utilized. Now, as far as the differences, if you need more information, it's out there. So get information on the differences, understand them, update your electrical safety program, train your workers on the new requirements. Please, this is really important. It, it, it's, 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 it's important to the worker, it's important to your company that we achieve sustainable and measurable results in electrical safety. We do that through the implementation of an electrical safety program with a documented risk assessment procedure. And there it's quoted right there. That's how you will achieve sustainable measurable results in performance and compliance, compliance to OSHA in the US and compliance to OHS regulations in Canada that your company can defend. So again, I do appreciate Easy Power for allowing me to present this webinar to you today. I, I do hope that uh, all of you um, did learn something or that you're gonna go, wow, okay, this is, a, I just, I didn't interpret it this way. So again, I hope that I've achieved that today. I do appreciate you, um, again, participating in this today. And uh, again, lastly, hope that uh, this webinar has enlightened you to the risk assessment procedure requirement in NFPA 70 and CSA Z462. So thank you and have a great day.